Good morning. This is our Friday Fuel today. I want to introduce Carla Tennis Kozura. Carla Tennis Kozura. Okay, I got it. Isn't that great? She is from Barry Warner and her managing broker when I asked for a successful realtor to come and speak at our, six, our, our Friday Fuels. This is who she suggested to me. Carla has a really interesting background in that she's not just been a regular residential realtor. She's did some, done some other interesting things. Carla, tell us a little bit about your path into real estate. Well, it's funny because when people ask me about my path to real estate, it actually started when I was a child. Um, my whole family was in real estate. In fact, I remember sitting open houses as a 12-year-old kid, which today would be completely illegal, but in the 70s, it seemed like it was okay. My father did rehabs. I'm from Los Angeles originally, um, and so he did rehabs in the Los Angeles area. And um, my brother also is in real estate and has his own brokerage in California right now as well. But I always rejected real estate because I said, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. But as I got older, I realized that real estate is a fantastic career. It offers a lot of flexibility. It offers um, great income potential. And um, together with my husband, we started as uh, rehabbers, flippers, property developers, etc. And that's kind of how I got my start in real estate was in the year 2000. We got married. Um, I was about to have children, etc. And I said, I need to have something that's more flexible and not just a corporate nine to five job. So we decided we would start by um, purchasing homes, rehabbing them and reselling them. And we live in Evanston. So there's a lot of great homes Right, great old Victorian homes that have been lived in and loved, uh, loved okay. in um, for 60, 70, 80 years, and we like to purchase a lot of those types of homes, rehab them, and then bring them into the 20, 21st century. What was the biggest challenge doing that? You know, I think initially you, you have to make a lot of mistakes, unfortunately, to learn because you can plan as much as you want, you create your pro forma. Um, budget, you create your pro forma income statement, etc. But things always change. You have to be adaptable. I think um, financing is an issue, right? Uh, making sure you have cash flow during these projects, making sure you, you stay within budget. And um, really, uh, in that scenario, you do need to find good deals or good prices on the onset because that's where you're going to make your money if you're able to get the home initially at a good price mm -hmm. and then of course that makes your margin even higher it makes you start out at a good at a good point did you always do the houses first and then find the clients or sometimes did you find the clients and then the clients found you um, so it, it's interesting we've been doing it now since the year 2000 so it happens a little bit in different ways um, we're at a point now where some realtors or people might contact us before a home has even gone on the market and they say, we have something that you might be interested in. Are you interested in seeing it and purchasing this for a flip? We have people who um, say, we love your work. This particular house that you have on the market right now that you've, you have rehabbed doesn't work for us for whatever reason. But if we were to find something and we can use you Carla, as our real estate agent, or we use another agent, will you be able to make this our dream home? So we do work in different ways where, yes, people buy our finished product, or they might work with us to find a home um, that then my husband will rehab. Yes. Husband happens to be, happen to be in the audience. <laughs> the other question I have with that is, in doing all the rehabs, because people who are doing flipping and rehabs have this question, where are you finding the people to help you? Where are you finding your well, subcontractors, your yes. people to help? We're very fortunate. We have a team of about 15 employees that are our full-time employees. And so that is a challenge as well, to keep 15 employees constantly employed mm -hmm. you know, throughout the duration of the year. Um, and then we just have built a portfolio of, of subcontractors that we work with. So we probably have a total a team of maybe 45 people. Um, and knock on wood, we're very fortunate. We have loyalty there, right? We have a lot of our employees who have been with us from the very beginning, um, the subcontractor, subcontractors as well. And um, we just have a really good team in place. And I think that does make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think so as yeah. well. Especially when, you're, especially when you're doing old homes, mm -hmm. because those people are fairly specialized. Mm -hmm. It's not like someone, uh, you know, you can't have a carpenter who builds, you know, tract housing 
come and say, oh, I'll work on your house too, because no, it's a different, it's very different. different thing. Yes. yes. I, I find that, you know, at least in Evanston, when we're working with a lot of these old, beautiful homes that have a lot of character, which by the way, we like to preserve, right? We like to use the old molding or keep the old staircase or keep the old doors. Like you could buy a, a um, cheap new door for a less expensive price than trying to re mm -hmm. refurbish an old door. But uh, we find that our clients who then buy the, our homes really like that old character. So we prefer to preserve that, preserve the architectural integrity. And so, you know, a lot of our employees are trained in that, like, oh, do not throw that away. <laughs> you keep that there. <laughs> do you, uh, this is kind of an off the wall question. Has HGTV influenced your business? Oh my goodness. I, I have to say that I don't, a lot of times HGTV, you know, it's a wonderful show. It's entertainment, but it, it doesn't really, in our opinion, reflect the reality, right? Because a lot of times they don't talk about carrying costs. They don't talk about the risk involved. They don't talk about, um, you know, many of the back, you know, the taxes, everything. They're just like, we bought it for this. We put in this and we made a million dollars and it's not necessarily I true. don't think they're always making a million dollars. No, I don't I'm think so. I'm pretty sure either. not, yeah. And, you know, with this type of rehab business, you really need to start... Um, as long as you're making money initially and, and over time that that line is heading uh, north is great. Yes. You can't expect that every single project is going to be, you know, making hundreds of thousands of dollars as long as you're making a little bit. There were some challenging times and we're, I think we're mm -hmm. in challenging market times right now. Mm -hmm. Probably quite honestly, and I've done this a long time, this is the strangest market I've ever been in right now. This other and absolutely lack of inventory. But there were other bad times that, as a builder, that you struggled through. What did you do when the other bad, when those old bad times hit? Well, we uh, not only are we builders, but we also um, own and manage property. So we were very fortunate in the last yes. time to actually we rented out all of our properties, including our principal residence, and we actually left. We went sailing for eighteen months. Um, nice. With our two young kids, we went sailing around the Atlantic, visited 21 different countries. But at that time, I do think that had we stayed behind, it might have been very difficult financially for us. Yes, for sure. Okay. Um, to try to continue the business, um, to try to continue selling and building. Um, and after that 18 month period, we were very fortunate that a lot of our employees wanted to come back to work with us because I think, unfortunately, they suffered as well, right? With, with no jobs at that time. So you had an interesting thing doing property management, doing rehabs and basically rehabs and flips. And now you work for a company. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, as I mentioned, I got into the business because we were managing a lot of our own rehabs and these uh, rental properties. And so that's why I got my license. And every once in a while, a friend would say, hey, can you sell my house? Can you help me buy a house? And so I was doing maybe you know, a few transactions a year with my own brokerage. And then I decided I wanted to get into real estate full time. I wanted to really work with buyers and sellers because I really actually enjoy this. I actually have fun with my job and I love my job. And um, at the time I thought, well, I have my boutique brokerage. I know that I can't compete with the bigger offices that have technology, that have tons of resources. So how am I, either I have to invest myself or I will just go work at a company. And believe me, for me, it was difficult to give up kind of the control mm -hmm. and the autonomy or giving up my own brokerage. But I um, interviewed with a few companies um, and uh, really I'm working with Baird and Warner in Evanston right now. It, for me personally, it was the best option. Um, and I also realized that there was some training, little holes that, of education that I probably didn't have because I had ha always just been my own managing broker. And so I do feel like I now am able to offer a robust offering, a robust service to all of my clients through the technology that I get, through the support that I get, and through the continuing education that I get there. What are the tools that you're using now? What are the what are your favorite things that you're doing you right know, now? Um, so again, at my company, we have a lot of great technology. We use Close. We use ZenList. We use. Um, I use uh, the cloud CMA that's available. I use InfoSparks for data. You know, a lot of this stuff is available to everybody. Some of these things are available only to the agents in the office that I work. Um, and I think Zoom and Google Meets has been a great tool. Um, just last night, I was saying that I had a, a, a listing presentation 
with three siblings who had inherited their parents' uh, building, and uh, you know we had some out-of-state people, and we were easily able to conduct that. So people are getting more used to using the technology, and it makes it much easier and more precise and more efficient, I guess I should say, in uh, reaching out to clients and being able to present all the data. If you had to have a philosophy, now, I'm, forgive me, I don't know this, how long have you been working in an office now? Uh, with, uh, I've been um, right before the pandemic. <coughs> all so right, so you've 20. been here since, for a couple of years now, mm -hmm. through the pandemic and that. If you had to say what changed in the way that you were working with clients before and now, uh, besides Zoom, mm -hmm. which we all learned that we could do things that we never imagined that we could do, what are the... What is the philosophy that you have with your clients now? One of the things I noticed you said is, I have fun with my clients. Mm -hmm. What else makes you a great realtor for your clients? I think, well, I like to pro pro um, approach this business in a very professional way. We are financial advisors. People are relying on us to make major life decisions, and I take that very seriously. And I do feel that our profession needs to be elevated, and I like to be part of that. Mm -hmm. process and so I do have a business degree I approach all my um, presentations in a very business-like manner providing market trends market data prior to getting into the comps I provide context anybody can open the take a key and open the door of the house but if you're not providing any context and additional value to your clients what are we there for so I really use a lot of the data to prove my point and I you know will look up data on the screen real time so that they can see the information, where I'm getting it, etc. And I just approach it like a corporate presentation. I really do see myself as that advisor helping people through these life transitions, right? Like we always talk about the seven D's of real estate, right? Um, whenever someone's either buying or selling, it's because there's an important transition going on their life, <coughs> going through their lives. And we are the people guiding them. We're holding their hands through this transition. We are buying and selling real estate every day, but many people aren't. So it's a scary process. It involves a lot of money. It involves a huge investment, etc. And I take that very seriously. Very much so. How do you stay in touch with your clients then? I do it in a variety of ways. Of course, social media is just a given. I'm always out there. Um, I'm very involved in the community. I'm very, I use text a lot. I use a lot of video. I send video texts, video emails. Um, I do, you know, gifts once in a while, let's say for Thanksgiving. And a lot of times I reach out just to provide value, right? I provide a CMA, even if somebody doesn't ask me. I might say, look at, you know, you might want to know what's going on in your neighborhood. Here's a CMA of, of what's happening and a price range of your, what your house might be worth. Um, or I might just say, hey, this popped on the market. I know you live on 555 Main Street. Um, this is 556. It just popped up, and that's kind of what I, what I do. It's in, it's in a variety of ways and a variety of times. It could be at a soccer game. It could be... In a in a flamenco performance, I dance flamenco, so it could be like. Well, wait, 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 you know? wait, 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 wait. So, um, I have actually seen. Um, there's a restaurant that we go down in in Florida where they do flamenco dancing. Mm -hmm. Where'd you learn to do that? Here in Chicago. Yes, here in Chicago. The, I started in. I moved to Chicago in 1997 and started fl dancing flamenco then. And I have done my rounds of being the dancer at the um, at the restaurants, like you're like you're saying. Mm -hmm. I've been on the big stage and um, festivals, things like that. I, I really enjoy it. I'm just going to tell you the story that way. We were down at the Columbia in Ybor City, mm -hmm. which is a famous Florida, and it was a corporate thing. And they were taking us out for dinner, and it was very nice. And you could see the men were going, "Oh, we have to go to a dance performance. So this is going to be a whole run." And just whining about it, and you know the rest of us are going. Well, this might be kind of interesting. And then the ladies, the whip, the the dancers started to dance, and all of a sudden it got so quiet at my table, and they were paying attention in ways they never imagined they were ever going to pay attention <laughs> to that kind of dancing. So could you? Well, the, the reason I like that type of dancing yeah. though is flamenco is the type of dance where you can be any age, shapes. You don't have to be 18 years old and you know 100 pounds or 95 pounds like a ballerina. Really, the more life experience, the more weight, the more it was. You, yes, the more you significant can bring to the dancing. Table. Yes, it was. That's <laughs> what I'd have to say. Significant dancing. 
Um, you have an interesting history about coming from different countries and I, you introduced your husband as coming from a different country. What, how has that had an influence in what you've done? Well, um, my, my family's also from Ecuador. Okay. So I grew up uh, bilingually Spanish-English. I um, lived in Ecuador. I went to high school there. I've lived abroad in Brazil, in Portugal, etc. And I always wanted languages and international culture to be part of my life. I ended up marrying somebody from Argentina. We speak Spanish at home. My kids are fully bilingual um, as well. And um, I mean, it, it has helped me in business, certainly because I do use my language. I do have Spanish-speaking clients who might not otherwise understand the process if I didn't speak the language. Um, but I also work with a lot of international reload clients. Uh, and even if I don't know their particular language, I do feel that having lived abroad or having understood trying to find housing abroad, that that certainly is helpful in working with those types of clients. I also understand when I read your resume that you're active in your community. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. And has that really had an impact on your business? Or is it the goodness of your heart? Well, um, my husband and I also have a separate small business in Evanston. We live in Evanston. And through that, I became um, involved in the Small Business Association there. It's called the Maine Dempster Mile. I'm also involved in my children's bilingual preschool that they went to. I'm on the board of, of their preschool currently, um, and which is located in Evanston. Through those two channels, I'm able to meet a lot of people. I'm not sure if that has directly impacted me in terms of direct sales, but what I have always dreamed about being a pillar in my community and being really involved and giving back. I've always wanted to do that. I love to be involved in making decisions that impact the community or helping with events in the community, etc. So I, um, I really enjoy that. You know, you don't get paid for that. Those are volunteer hours, but I, I love that. And it also makes me be able to sell Evanston better because I understand what's going on in the background through these through these um, through these organizations. Okay, if you were taking a new agent under your wing, what would you tell them to do? I think you know. I think it's very important to be the 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 knowledge have the knowledge of your market. If you say you are an expert in Evanston, you better be the expert in Evanston. You better understand what the trends are on all levels. You need to understand what's going on behind the scenes, like we were talking about. Um, I think also just keeping in mind to provide context and, and be of value constantly. However you can be of value, however you can t reach out, build those relationships, provide statistics, provide information, be a resource for your clients. And I think because it's first about building trust, right? You need to build that trust so that somebody will look at you and say, I think this person will be a good advisor for a real estate decision. So first it's building trust, and that is based on relationships and providing value. Trust is a word that has come up in almost every presentation we've done in one of these, mm -hmm. trust. The other two words that I'm kind of thinking about is one is authenticity. And another one that I'm really kind of struggling with thinking about is likability. Mm -hmm. How important is for an agent to be likable? Oh, I think it's very important. Again, uh, clients are trusting, entrusting in you very important financial decisions. They need to like who they're working with. I don't think people can work closely and work well unless you were to like the professional that you're working with. Now, having said that, of course, there are times when maybe there's a client that you might not uh, necessarily jive with and perhaps <laughs> might not necessarily. Yes, not. and so maybe that's the time to use work with a friend and refer, you know, to someone in your office because you do want that transaction to be successful and you want it to be seamless and so you want them to be working with whoever is the right fit. And I think the likability it was interesting the last discussion I had about this. They said, you know, I think it's more important, most important for people who are just beginning because you are trying to convince people to work for you. When you have a book of business and you've sold 50 bazillion dollars worth of real estate, people have a trust in you in a different way mm -hmm. than they may have had when you are, you are beginning. But I think this likability thing is so, it's so interesting to me simply because at one point, and in one of the companies I worked for, they had a team of people and every time I was near them, I wanted to back away from them. 
you know, mm -hmm. that was really my, my visceral reaction to them was, oh, wait. And finally someone said to me, you just have to get over that. Someone likes that kind of person. You may not like that kind of person, but someone else will. Sure. Yeah. So this variety of referring and that sort of thing. I, I do want to just emphasize that I think everybody has something to offer. You know, when you're talking about what I would recommend to a new agent, everybody has tools in their toolbox, right? They're just different. Everyone just has different tools in their toolbox. And I look, like to look at the model. In my mind, the way I visualize my model is I'm the hub of a wheel, like on a cart. Mm -hmm. My, who I am, my personality, my experience, my um, work ethic, my service offering is in the hub of the wheel. But the spokes are these different influences, right? So it could be the MBA, it could be the community involvement, it could be the property management, the property development. So everybody is the hub of their own wheel. They just have to know which spoke they are pulling from in order to offer their services and highlight that. I mean, I think many people say, well, I am starting a real estate. I don't even know where to begin or what to do. If you look, if you tap into your experience, your friends, your communities, you need to build the communities to tap into to then, um, you know, I don't want to say use, but those communities are a foundation for potential clients, mm -hmm. right? So I think if you can think of what are the spokes on your wheel that contribute to what makes you successful and what you offer. And as I was listening to you talk about spokes, I was thinking about spokes that I'm always talk about all the other people who have their hand in the transaction. Mm -hmm. Also, you need to have some kind of relationship with them. But I was thinking even more of, I know you're using social media quite a bit. Mm -hmm. What are you using and what is the benefit that you're getting from that? I think social media, I'm not sure you're going to get, for me personally at least, I don't know if I get brand new clients out of the blue, somebody who's never seen me before. But what it does do is reinforce that I'm out there, I'm doing my job, I'm doing it um, consistently, I'm doing it well. Um, I have been using video quite a bit lately on my uh, social media, and I think it's showing that I'm... I'm the one who's really going to be selling your house. I'm the one who's out there. I'm promoting that like crazy. We're using video. We're using drones. We're using all sorts of technology to sell your property. And so I've had a lot of people who say, wow, you're really busy or wow, you, you're really selling that house. So hopefully that's going to be, keep me top of mind for when they want to recommend or refer to a friend or maybe whenever they're ready to buy or sell. They're thinking she's the one. She's out there. She's really doing it. Um, also during the pandemic, we did a lot of, um, Instagram live, Facebook live or virtual type tours. I used video quite a, quite a bit during the pandemic and I still, you know, I still use that. If I'm at an open house, we're live at the open house, you know, have you got any, tr any tricks or tips you want to share about using video? Video is tricky. And we, we've been talking, we were talking about that before we began. Anything that you're finding as you've been using it more and more, what are you getting better at? Well, I um, actually at Baird and Warner, we have a great department that helps with video. So I um, have been relying a lot on them. I don't edit my own things necessarily. I, we have a department that, you know, we pay for, but right. um, we certainly have the support in place at our company to help with those. I think keeping it concise, I don't think anything more than 30 seconds is really going to catch anyone's attention. And I try to do a little bit of a something fun. Like, for example, we did a video of a condo that I was selling and it had a Juliet balcony. And so we kind of had a fun time with it. And I said, this balcony is not just for looking for Romeo. It's a <laughs> beautiful feature in this, in yeah. this condo. And let's take a look at what else we've got here. And so, you know, some sort of catchy phrase is mm -hmm. great. Um, yes. I think keeping it 30 seconds or less <clears throat> and then trying to keep it personable, you know, trying to show your personality is what it is. We're almost coming to the end of the time that I want to talk about this. What famous last words do you want to share while we're doing this? Think about, uh, let me, think about your audience. We have 1,400 members, uh, 4,000 4, members who may see what you are, see you and do this. What would you like to tell them about business? I think um, this is a great business. You can do whatever you want with this business, right? With real estate, you can be the top producer. You can do it part-time. I just think we really are professionals. We need to show 
our clients that we're professionals. Let's elevate this profession. Let's make it a real good profession and let's do our jobs. I, and I think it's something that just provides an endless opportunities. And so I think that's wonderful. And let's just make that happen. Let's be successful. Let's, let's have fun. Thank you very much. It's been lovely. We didn't really know each other very well. It's yes. been really nice to get to know each <laughs> nice other a little to get more. To know you too. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. The views and opinions expressed by this presenter are theirs. They may not reflect the views of North Shore Barrington Association of Realtors. Thank you.